Hello and welcome. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for June 5th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware for, from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold a meeting in the CircuitPython dash dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 Pacific, except when it co coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar where you can, you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Discord. Check the pins messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but can not attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of the CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. This thir the third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. The fifth and final part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for lo more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. That covers how the meeting will go. And with that, we'll get started with community news. I'll switch docs here. And uh, do community news. So, uh, Community news is uh, a brief look at all things Circuit Python, Python, <laughs> MicroPython, and Python on on microcontrollers generally. Um, it is a preview of a newsletter that goes out every Tuesday morning. Thanks to Anne. Um, so the first thing here was we have uh, notes of a new release to the Python editor, Thony editor, which provides new features. A new version of the Thony Python editor has been released with bug fixes and new features. The default installation uses Python 3.10 and looks to run in 64-bit mode. ESP flashing dialog now allows, now allows selecting from a list of uh, known MicroPython and CircuitPython variants and downloads them for you. Uh, this is version 4.1, and you can check out this uh, link to the Twitter post about it as well. Three, three. Uh, next up, we have PyCon US 23 and PyCascades 23 videos are out now. Uh, the PyCon US 2023 talks are now available on the PyCon U US YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash c slash PyCon US. Uh, PyCascades 23. Uh, the PyCascades 2023 talk recordings are now available on the PyCascades YouTube channel. And there's a big long link that I will not read off. Um, but you can check it out. Uh, in the Discord channel or in the notes doc um, or the newsletter that comes out tomorrow. Uh, speaking of YouTube, uh, there's a new MicroPython YouTube channel that's official. I just subscribed to myself and it looks like uh, they have the MicroPython meetup videos there, which is awesome and they're very useful to, to hear about all the latest and greatest things in MicroPython land. Um, and that is youtube.com slash at micropython official. All right, last up. Uh, software driving hardware. Hackaday was talking about Christopher Barnett's 
very insightful analysis of what the future holds for the Raspberry Pi single board computers on their podcast. On the one hand, they're becoming such competent computers that they are beginning to compete with lightweight desktop machines instead of just being a hacker curiosity. On the other hand, especially given the shortage and the increase in price that has come with the Pi's expanding memory endowments, a lot of people who would just throw in a Raspberry Pi are starting to think more carefully about their options. These days, there is no shortage of microcontrollers that have enough memory, both flash and RAM, to support a higher level environment like MicroPython. If you think about it, MicroPython brings to the microcontrollers a lot of what the people were of what people were using a Raspberry Pi for in projects anyway, a friendly interactive programming environment that was free of the compile here, flash there, debug cycle. If you're happy coding Python on a single board Linux computer, you'll be more or less happy coding in MicroPython or CircuitPython on a microcontroller. And that's it for the preview of the Python on Hardware newsletter. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community run newsletter emailed every Tuesday morning. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest uh, Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. That's github.com slash adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter. There's a drafts folder there. Take, that, take a look at that and submit a pull request um, with the changes. You may also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And 2231Puppy, I'm happy to. I can read. I can read your question. Uh, Thanks for dropping in. Really appreciate it. All right, next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the the state of CircuitPython meant to kind of ground us in objective metrics. Um, These are numbers from the last seven days. Um, We do, if the meetings shift, we do kind of miss things. So sorry if we missed you, Um, but let's get started overall. So overall, we had 17 pull requests merged from 10 different authors. Um, so new names to me are Graham Winter, Tom, Tamia Hola, Ola, um, Julian Akulo, Klulo, uh, Hicks0329, Rakola, and Atlantor are already are all somewhat new. Thank you to them, and thank you to our consistent authors as well. Uh, we had six reviewers, which is awesome. So thank you to reviewers. We support, uh, well, reviewers support authors, so we really appreciate it. Uh, Issues-wise, overall, we had 20 closed issues by 13 people and 15 open by 15 people. So we're net down just a few, um, which is great. Okay, for the core, uh, we had four pull requests merged from four different authors. Um, we had two reviewers, and we have 23 currently open pull requests. Um, it looks like most of those are a week old, and uh, not a bunch of new stuff, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. And a number of those are drafts, and a lot of those drafts also have to do with boards, so please take a look and see if you can't help move along any of these old PRs. That'd be great. But being at 23, we're under my kind of like rule of thumb of being <laughs> under a single page. So issues-wise for the core, we had five closed issues by four people and eight open by eight people. So we are net up three for a total of 654 open issues. Uh, you can check those out all on GitHub. We have seven active milestones. Uh, milestones are used to know what we've triaged and uh, kind of set prioritization for those of us that are funded by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. We have one open issue for 8.2, um, which... I opened and has to do with the CPX library not working on the CPX anymore. Seems kind of like a bad thing. Um, We have 37 open issues for 8.xx. These are kind of like things we should do soon, uh, but no concrete plans to do. And then 9.0 are things that we want to do for the next major stable release. Um, We have two issues not assigned to milestone as of the these stats. So um, we'll have to take a look at those and make sure that they get triaged as well. So that's it for the core, and I'm going to hand it off to Jeff for the library update. Hello. So uh, Katni is 
up to something else, I assume she's watching the Apple keynote. So I'll read the library <laughs> section. This, um, let me get back to the text because I'm not as good at reading this as her. Uh, yeah, so this describes um, all of the CircuitPython libraries, most of which begin Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, although there are a few outliers that don't. And the last week's activity saw 13 pull requests merged by six authors, um, including some of those that uh, Scott already mentioned as new or infrequent contributors. We had five reviewers, uh, and thanks to all those reviewers for enabling us to keep the software quality of the libraries high. There is a list of the merged pull requests in the notes document, which I won't read off. Issues wise, um, that leaves us with 60 open pull requests, rather, um, with the oldest nearing 1,000 days, which is um, maybe in need of some attention, and the newest is one day old. Issues wise, we saw 12 issues closed by seven people and seven opened by seven people. It's nice to see the range of activity and always fun when we go down a little bit in issue numbers. Of those issues, we've got 50 that are tagged good first issue. And you can review all of this at circuitpython.org. Just click the contributing link at the top of the page. You'll find a list of all the open pull requests, open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. If you'd like to contribute to CircuitPython by writing Python, this is a great place to start. You can sort the issues by label, so you can search for good first issue if you're just getting started, or bug or enhancement if you're looking for something a little more advanced. We have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, and we're always available to help you get started with that, so let us know if you need any assistance. And um, of course, I mentioned that you can find the open pull requests there. Your uh, informal reviews on pull requests are always welcome, and if you find that you are enjoying consistently doing that, we can level you up and put you on the review team, which, among other things, will allow your name to appear in the list in this uh, document. So thanks also to everybody who is commenting on pull requests and testing them and is not uh, among the formal ranks of reviewers. All right, I've just got a little bit more statistics. We track how many downloads there are of the libraries from PyPI, and that was, um, over the last seven days, 111,186 PyPI downloads of our 310 libraries. And there's a list of the top 10 libraries by download counts in the notes doc. Next, we've got libraries updated in the last seven days. There are about four that were updated, which I won't read off, and there is a new library, uh, which is in the community bundle called CircuitPython Display HT16K33 by um, Jay Posada 202020, which I'm, I'm not familiar with that display, but I think, is that one of the um, LED-based displays? So check that out if you are into that sort of thing. And uh, that wraps it up for the libraries. Back to you, Scott. Thank you, Jeff. OK, uh, next up, I'm going to read for Blinka. Uh, Blinka is the CircuitPython API compatibility layer that sits atop MicroPython and uh, also works on single board computers, such as Raspberry Pi, uh, to provide the CircuitPython API. Uh, in Blinka, there were zero pull requests merged. There are three currently open, um, and they've all Two of them have been open quite a while, so I doubt that they're going to be in anytime soon. Platform Detect has one currently open that is usually done for adding new single board computer support. Uh, issues wise, for Blinka, there were three closed issues by three people and zero open by zero people. That's also great. Uh, for a total of 94 open issues uh, on Blinka itself. Uh, download stats for Blinka uh, PyPI downloads in the last week was 11,097. PyWheels downloads in the last month was 7,076, and there are now 119 supported boards. That's it for Blinka, and that's it for this state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. Next up, we have Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to the folks in our community for doing awesome things. It's done as a round robin, so I will start, and then we'll go down the list of folks who are uh, listed in the notes doc and hopefully in the meeting as well. Um, as always, if you're not able to make the meeting, feel free to drop uh, notes in here and I will read them off so you'll hear that too. Um, so for me, let me take another time code. I just wanted to give a hug to uh, TAC who does uh, for continued tiny USB and tiny UF2 support. 
um, just following that and uh, watching all of the different microcontrollers that get support is really fun. So thanks to TAC for taking that on. Next up, we have Dan. OK, thanks. Um, I'd like to thank um, Greg Neveroff. Uh, he and I had a very helpful um, audio discussion about um, he has some async IO changes that have been proposed that have been in the pipeline for a while. And now that 810 is finished, I'm trying to circle back to those. So we had a really good discussion. OK. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Next up, I have notes from DJ Devon 3. Uh, Take a time code. DJ Devin 3 says, uh, hug report to Ventru for helping uh, to turn a hard cut RGB cycle into a nice rainbow fade using PWM. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, hug reports for me uh, this week first. Thanks uh, to you, Scott, for sharing some insight into uh, some of the bits inside of Core Display IO. Uh, hug report for Jose David, who created the virtual HT16K33 uh, emulator uh, library and shared that in the community bundle. It's a super interesting thing. Um, and uh, lastly for me, thanks to Maker Melissa uh, for some suggestions uh, on the non-blocking marquee functionality inside of the uh, HT16K33 library. Thanks. Thanks, Omi guy. Next up is Jeff. Hello again. I wanted to thank Melissa for testing the Matrix Portal S3 board definition and figuring out that we needed to update ProtoMatter. And of course, Philby for advancing ProtoMatter to work better on the S2 and S3 using the LCD peripheral controller. Uh, that presents a few issues for the CircuitPython update, but I think it will really make the display on those uh, microcontroller families work a lot better. So it'll be cool to see that come into CircuitPython. And uh, then a big list of people who have been showing off SynthIO. JP, uh, Mark, and Liz were on Show and Tell last week, and they all had projects based on it. And Toddbot has been making some videos about it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, uh, how that's going when we get down to my status updates. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up, I have two more to round us out that are both folks missing the meeting, so I will read them off. First up, Katni's missing the meeting and says, hugs to Blit City DIY for generating a fixing object for me for an upcoming guide. Hugs to Dan H for a ton of help understanding the wiring behind a breakout board. And last up, we have notes from maker Melissa, who says, uh, hug report to Dan H for help with getting my CircuitPython environment functioning. Hugs to Jepler for making a board definition for the new matrix portal and a group, group hug. That's it for Hug Reports. Next up, we have Status Updates. Status Updates is a chance for you to talk about what you've been working on in the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. This is great for collaboration and uh, also just knowing kind of where everyone's at and what, what they're working on. So uh, I will start and we'll go through the list just like we did for Hug Reports. So for me, um, I added one wire and UART support to the pirate code. This kind of gets me to the point where I think it's good for 1.0. I poked at the STM32G0 for a bit of a pirate break, and uh, I'm crashing it now, so I'll probably poke at a little bit for a break today or this week as well. Just trying to get Blinky going on it. Um, I did a little bit of MCU flasher work, uh, but the SAMD51 is still pretty unreliable to the point where it feels like it's bricked, which is not great. Um, so I don't really feel confident in that code right now. Um, so I'm taking a break from that. That's like really, really deep down into the weeds of my grows, which is takes some, takes some uh, grit to, to do. Um, this week, I think I'll be taking another deeper look at USB host in CircuitPython, starting with the IMXRT. Um, TAC has done some work since I looked at it last, and I need to take a, a more thorough look at, at it and see if I can't get it working. Um, lastly, I got... And I, I got a laser cut um, chipboard that is a grid of 0 0.1 inch holes with at, at a two inch of uh, uh, 0.2 inch spacing. Uh, my idea being that I could mount Adafruit boards, including my imagined synth modules to it. Um, but one problem I have is that because it's spaced at 0 0.2 inches, I can't um, fit anything that's an odd number of tenths of an inch apart. And that includes feathers. So I'm curious to think what 
if, if anybody has any ideas about how I could do this, like I could stagger one set of columns to give us an odd number, that sort of thing. Um, curious if anybody's interested in this. Uh, it's kind of my idea is that it's like going to be your structural backing for putting together like bespoke controllers and stuff like that. Um, anyway, that's what I'm thinking about and that's what I'm planning on doing this week. Uh, next up, let's hand it over to Dan to hear about what he's up to. Okay, so as I already mentioned, I had a meeting with Greg Neverall for about ASICIO changes, and um, we will it, it will work on some various things. Uh, he's there's a PR to the core, which should not interfere with the current library. So he's going to make sure that's correct and then uh, bring it up to date. And then in terms of the library, um, the library was just sort of for testing purposes. So it probably um, we may just close that PR for now and eventually work on like a cleaned up version of that once um, what he's working on will be moved in. And what he's really working on is trying to make a, an event loop that is not always polling so that um, if you're running a bunch of async IO tasks, then uh, there won't be a loop that's always running in the background, checking to see whether they're okay. It might Things might even go to sleep or uh, in general block on something that would allow um, less CPU spin. That's what he's working on. Um, okay, that's the most interesting thing. The other very minor thing I'm working on, but it, seems to be taking too much time is that uh, I'd like it so that you can just fetch the submodules for a particular port instead of going to the top level and fetching all the submodules, which now takes several minutes because we have so many submodules. And I thought this would be really trivial to do, and it turns out it's not. Uh, one reason is that all the port make files assume that you're building boards. But here's a new target that isn't a board build, and so that was that was an, that assumption about it, building a board was wrong, and I had to undo a bunch of stuff because of that. And also the other thing is that it's ex just extremely painful to do any kind of programming with if statements and doing computation either in GNU Make or in Shell. They're both kind of horrible as programming languages, so. Uh, I've gone through several iterations on this, but I think I'm seeing the end, the light at the end of the tunnel right now. And then finally, uh, I would hope to start working on the MicroPython, the merge of MicroPython version 1.19.1 1. uh, into uh, main, which is a prerequisite, or it's something that we're planning for 9.00, not for any of the eight releases. And I hope to start on that this week. Okay. Yeah, and noting that once that's merged in, that will really turn us into 9.0. Right. I don't think it'll be a draft for a while until we're really done with 8, or we need to fork. Yeah, we can bridge. Yeah. Um, I think I was talking with Jimmo a little bit, and 121 might be out by the time we want to get 9.0 out. So it might be that you do 19, Jeff does 20, and I'll do 21. Okay, so that'd be good. Really caught up. And I think I asked him, and he didn't think uh, 21 would be a different MPY version either. So we, I guess we could do it as a 9.1 or something. But Yeah, I, I would see that 19.1 would be like an alpha, which would, because we don't want to have, we want to just have one. By the time we get to the betas, we want all the, the MPY to be stable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I probably, I may even not do an alpha release until until we're on the MPY version number that we know we want to be on. That might be a good idea, yeah. Well, like, we can do S3 builds, but not not actual alphas until we're on yeah. the version we're going to do, just for clarity. Anyway, right. thanks, thanks, Dan. Good. All right, next up, I have notes from DJ Devon 3 who says, uh, making progress on my rechargeable BLE RGB candle. I added a rainbow fade effect. Battery life had, with a 500 milliamp hour battery is about three days. With a 2000 milliamp hour battery, it's over a week before requiring a recharge. Hacking up the base of an electronic candle with SNPs is fun and somewhat necessary for beginners. 
Replicating a 3D printable version to allow for better, better component placement is, is the ideal solution. Uh, next up, uh, let's hear from Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, last week, I refactored the non-blocking marquee functionality that I added to HT16K33 library um, to make it uh, reuse the code better uh, between the blocking version that existed previously and the non-blocking version. It now uses some of the same code, and we were able to eliminate some repetition inside of there, which is nice to try to cut the size of the library down some. Um, I also pushed forward a couple typing PRs that had stalled from their original uh, submitting authors. I got a few of those um, up to the point where they could be completed last week, and then I have a couple more that I've been working on uh, this week. Um, I polished up the RGB LED server library that I've been working on. I have now added all of the remaining functionality that I had uh, planned at least, although uh, maybe some more stuff will come to mind. Um, and I would say it's nearly ready to make the uh, initial release and get it added to the community bundle. Uh, so I hope to do that this week. Um, over the weekend, I did a good chunk of soldering on, uh, I think uh, it was Saturday, I think it was. Um, I soldered up some quad, uh, quad feather proto boards as well as a couple feather wings that I had um, already received but hadn't used yet, so they didn't have any pins on them. Uh, uh, for uh, this week, I will be uh, also jumping back into the core display I/O issue with the hidden elements to uh, try to get that wrapped up. And that is what I have. Thanks. Thanks, foamy guy. All right, next up, let's hear from Jeff. Hello again. I was just adding my in the weeds topic, so let me scroll back up. But uh, last week, I um, implemented bike quad filtering in SynthIO, and earlier this morning, I just moved that out of draft status. There are several other simple kinds of filters that can be created within the same bike quad structure and mathematics that would be useful. Those are called notch, uh, peak, low shelf and high shelf. Uh, and I'm gonna leave that as a separate item because I think that would be fairly easy for someone else to contribute. It's mostly math that you copy out of a web page and just a tiny bit of, uh, you know, put this in shared bindings, put this in um, shared module. So I think that would be feasible for someone else to pick up. Anyway, this week I'm updating Protomatter, which is a requirement for finishing the Matrix Portal S3 board definition. Since the last time we updated Protomatter, uh, Paint Your Dragon has changed it so that it uses the, I think it's the LCD control peripheral um, to clock out the data, which um, has some really nice advantages because it's being done by a peripheral instead of a software loop, but it needs some structural changes in how CircuitPython interacts with it. Uh, and as well, there are some uh, changes within the Protomatter library that, for instance, hit warnings that we have enabled in CircuitPython as errors, and those need to be, to be addressed. So. That will be a pull request on Protomatter and an addition to the open pull request on CircuitPython. And now I've got a bigger set section for non-CircuitPython stuff. Uh, I'm working on a guide for the Adafruit Learn system that shows how to use the CPM emulator called RunCPM on uh, Feather RP2040 board. I'm the, the code is done, but I'm still seeing occasional crashes from the project. I think it's due to the overclocking for the digital video output. Um, I'm also really excited. I use the RP2040 Bitbang USB host in this project, and it'll be really nice once this is available in CircuitPython someday. And then in uh, non-CircuitPython, non-Adafruit stuff, um, I built an EEPROM programmer so that I can update the firmware of my Xerox 820. That was a lot of fun. It's really just a bunch of wires and one pull-up resistor. Um, I'm so glad I missed the era where you had to use an ultraviolet light to erase your chips. And uh, if you're into this, buy your 2816 EEPROMs now because they are fully obsolete and hard to find. And that's what I'm up to. Uh, Jeff, the one thing I would request is you should take a look at the EEPROM stuff in Bus Pirate and see if we can't do it in Circuit Pirate as well. Oh, I should. Yeah, I wrote a, a Circuit Python code, but it's just, you know, it's just a Circuit Python program. It's not tied in with um, Bus Pirate or anything like that. 
These right. are uh, parallel EEPROMs, so they have a very large number of pins. There's like, um, mm -hmm. it's a 24-pin okay. chip, and 22 of them are uh, data signals, then your voltage and ground. So I don't think it fits within the bus pri pirate Correct. form factor. Yep. But there's maybe some way that it could intersect with bus pirate, and I'd love to figure that out with you. Yeah, either that or just a library. You could have a circuit Python library then. Anyway, that's where my <laughs> that's where my brain is. All right, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, last up, I have two uh, folks who were missing the meeting, so I'll read those off just like last time. Um, so first up, Katni's missing the meeting, and last week says uh, put the Feather RP twenty forty DVI guide into moderation. Started the chalk neo key breakout guide. Realized there's no MX neo key breakout guide when I looked for it for cribbing purposes. Uh, started updating the chalk guide to be a chalk slash MX neo key breakout guide. This week, uh, fin finished up the fixes from Liz's review of the DVI feather guide. Finished updating the existing content of the neo key breakout guide to re refer to both types. Continuing on the chalk slash MX neo key breakout guide. And next up is the stemo gamepad the TRRS Jack Breakout Guide, and all of the other things. And lastly, we have notes from maker Melissa, who says, uh, last week fixed a couple issues with the CircuitPython code editor, testing, tested out the new matrix portal board def from, that Jeff created. This week, we'll test out uh, protomatter updates Jeff is making to the core, uh, coming through matrix portal and portal based libraries to make it more flexible. Uh, need to test PR for the code editor on mobile, but will revert a revert I made for a split screen for the split screen feature. All right, and that's it for Huggleport or status updates. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Uh, last up, we have in the weeds. In the weeds is a chance for us to have any longer form discussions we want to have. Um, and uh, there's notes from two two three one puppy that I'll start with, and we'll talk about. And then we'll go on to Jeff as well. So uh, if anybody has any other topics you'd like to talk about in the weeds, please add them as you think of them so that we don't have to wait, uh, wait around at all. OK, so first up, uh, 2231 Puppy says, could a Docker or Podmon container for building CircuitPython be of use? Right now, it takes a lot of manual configuration and setup to compile. And I'm wondering if that could be simplified. And my personal, I've never liked using Docker. That's what I'll say. Um, they just seem gigantic, and they don't really help me out. So I tend to prefer wanting to set it up locally. But I also do it really frequently, or use it really frequently, so I don't have to do the setup a lot. Um, it'd be great if somebody else supported it, but I don't know enough about Docker to do it myself. Um, this is something that came up really long ago, like Tony... Uh, who is former Adafruit was doing that, uh, but I never really I've not I've not gotten it, not grokked it. Um, any other comments about this? I know Jeff, you've written notes in there. Yeah, I was writing some comments in the document, so I'll just jump in with those. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is I'm just unfamiliar with Docker, and so I wondered uh, what like what would it look like to build the software if this was a thing that existed. Um, and then I wondered how much ongoing work is required to maintain these Docker images. So for instance, when we change um, from one version of ESP IDF to another, or one version of GCC to another, what has to happen? Um, how do you ensure that you can go back and build an old version of the CircuitPython software? Um, and then the uh, third observation I had is this uh, we have the information about how to build the software repeated multiple times. We have it as code in the GitHub Actions. We have it as pros in the um, documentation. And the documentation is probably repeated on um, Learn as well as in the core uh, in GitHub and Markdown files. And when we, when we do this, can we reuse the Docker to build uh, from within GitHub Actions to substitute for those setup steps? Um, is there, you know, how does this help with reducing the overall cognitive load, or is it just creating another thing in addition to GitHub Actions, in addition to the written documentation? Those are the questions that I have about this. And I, I really sympathize with the difficulty of picking up software and building it 
and how that um, can keep away first time contributors. So I, if it's a an improvement, I'm really open to it as opposed to um, kind of what Scott was saying. So I think we need to approach it from the point of view of how does it help somebody who wants to be a first time contributor and think about it from that point of view. So those are, are my thoughts. Thank you. Dan, do you have thoughts too? I also like, I, I had to try to learn Docker for unrelated reasons a long time ago and I didn't get very far and it just seemed inconvenient, <laughs> but uh, it may it may well be fine. I mean, I'm the one who maintains the building circuit Python guide. Uh, I've tried not to put detailed instructions in the repo because they get out of date. I'd rather have only one place to do them. So, uh, I just assume not have uh, manual instructions, except in a very broad sense, in the in the repo if, we're, if they're going to be in the learn guide too. Um, uh, I mean, some people, you know, expert programmers often look in the repo for how to do something, and we have other. So it, it's sort of like a, a little bit of a tension between who are we who who are the who are we catering toward, but mm -hmm. I think the learn guide is okay. Um, I think we could try it. There are people who have offered this in the past, but it's never, it's never been completed. So it would be great. It would, like, it would be nice to be able to, for people to use all the same version of Git and things like that. A lot of the stuff that's in the Learn Guide is about exceptions because of very differences between various things. And I also don't know whether Docker would help people who have, like, I want to build this on a Mac. And uh, can you use Docker to create a Linux-like environment on a Mac or not? I'm not sure. So that's another open question. So I don't know, uh, 2231 Puppy, if you have anything to type about this, uh, be interested. I mean, if you're f familiar with Docker, then you could make up a straw, a straw man kind of example or something, I don't know. Yeah, I think the other thing that I think about is like microdevs did some pretty interesting work with leveraging uh, the integration between like the code spaces, right? The online editor in GitHub and GitHub Actions. So it's possible that maybe that's the way, the route that we go. Like if you want it all set up for you, you do the online editor and then just use GitHub Actions to produce your art artifacts. But you have to pay money for Using code I spaces? Know. I think so, yeah. So one comment, because we use Docker at my work to build basically Linux images on Windows is, I think there is some advantage there for people jumping in. Just from having gone through setting up Windows on Linux, that's a little bit of a journey all on its own, that if you don't wanna take that step, you could run into a barrier the one caveat to that is your USB handling becomes tricky. I found how to work around that, um, but it can become a little bit of a, a barrier when you're trying to transfer things or I, in the end, a lot of times I use putty or mu on my windows side and just mount a drive and copy things over to put new uh, builds on, but if it ever comes to flashing on that, you get kind of lost. Right, that's, that's I guess a problem because the, the development cycle is not just compiling, it's compiling and then flashing and then maybe using, even using a J-Link or something, usually not, but yeah. You, and yeah, you can use, I did get success running J-Link because it's actually fairly well built in that you can have remote J-Links through IP mm -hmm. a lot. And then the newest versions of some of the the Windows uh, Linux tie-ins have mounting USB. So I'm not sure if Docker's incorporated those. So there's definitely advantages, but at my workplace, we've got a full-time person that handles infrastructure, including the Docker setup. So there is a certain amount of work to maintain it. Yeah, and I don't think any of us other core devs are the people that, that will do that, unfortunately. 
So yeah, so 2231 puppy, if you can come up with an existence proof or something, that would be great. All right. Um, I see they're typing. That's a fair point about USB. I wonder if there's a better container solution or something else to make it easier. Thanks for the input. Yeah, I mean, I think to some degree, good docs are, can get you pretty far um, with that. Because if you use any sort of setup system, then you have to teach people how to use that setup system. And I, that's, I think, where I've always gotten lost with Docker. And then I'm like, why is it taking 50 gigs? Anyway, um, <laughs> that's my bias. Uh, OK. But it sounds like Mark could be a really good resource for that as well. Thank you, Mark. OK, let's move on, and let's go to Jeff. All right, well, I was prompted to do this by Scott when we were kind of getting off track during uh, status updates. And I wanted to talk about, during the CircuitPython 9 cycle, how we're going to handle these uh, changing MPY magic numbers. If I understand mm -hmm. right, what we're going to see is one bump during the 219, or one bump when we merge MicroPython 1.19.1, and then a second bump when we merge 1.20. And those are going to be fairly well separated in time. And we want to reduce user pain while all this is happening. So uh, here's kind of what I understood and what I made up in my head from what we were talking about. We wouldn't make a formal release like a circuitpython.org release until we think the MPY format is stable. And that would be after the 1.20 merge. But we still need to uh, create a get tag so that the circuitpython version number will reflect that it's a nine, like nine alpha zero rather than being uh, an eight one. And then my totally random thought was that it might be helpful to show the MPY version required somewhere, whether that's in the banner that you see, like when you open the REPL, um, or whether it's written into the, into the bootout.txt file. Uh, that may not be super important because, um, well, let me back up a second. Um, historically, tools like CircUp have had to maintain a mapping from like this version number 7.3 uses this um, bundle version. And maybe by putting the MPY version number somewhere like bootout.txt, it could simplify this part of CircUp so that we could say, this is MPY version 23, this is MPY version 25. I don't know what the version numbers are. Um, and then that doesn't have to be maintained in CircUp anymore, but could be easily seen by anybody who looks at the bootout file, including automated software like CircUp. And that's my brain dump. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I, I think that's the the numbering that I'm really trying to tie to is the major version number. Um, but like you've hit on, like the tricky part with this is that we're going to do two, two kind of bumps internally. Well, I, as I every time I said, like I could make a branch, which was the MicroPython merge nine O branch. And we could not merge that back to main until it's all done. I don't know if that'd be too confusing or not. If that would. Yeah, I think my I think my main concern with that is that we have a lot of infrastructure for getting builds off main, which is really helpful for debugging. Yeah. Right. So being able to go into S three and pick the different commits and just see if bugs are there would be really nice. Um, so that's kind of I think why I was thinking. Um, thinking that one thing we could do is we could pull a Microsoft and skip 9.0. <laughs> like we could do a nine for for when 119 is merged in, and then with 120 we could go straight to 10. Uh, that would confuse everybody. I'm into it. <laughs> um, so we that's one option is like if we if we really want to be strict about our major numbers matching up with. Uh, MPY versions, we could do that too. Like numbers are free, so, like I like to say. So then we would uh, hypothetically have 9.1 be the first stable 9 and 9.0 would be the the in-between version. It would no, no, I'm saying 10. Release. It no. would be 10.0. Oh, there would never be a final release of 9. Oh. Right. 
like yeah. we would we would have nine oh alpha zero just like you're saying, but then we would with the one twenty merge we'd just call that ten oh alpha zero. We can stew about this. <laughs> so let me see. Let me see how much work it is to do the merge, and then, like, we can see. We like, can, yeah, we can decide then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I guess I'm running the meeting, so I should wrap us up. <laughs> Um, thank you both for that discussion. All right, let me scroll down in the doc here. Hit wrap up. Um, thank you all again for, uh, let me take the last time code. Uh, thanks everybody for joining for this uh, CircuitPython Weekly for June 5th, 2023. Um, thank you for all for coming, even though, uh, <laughs> even though there's an Apple Keynote that we're competing with. Um, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython for Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be, let me check my calendar to make sure I'm right, uh, at our normal time next week, uh, June 12th. And uh, Jeff is running it at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 Pacific on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. With that, Thank you all. Uh, we'll have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>